in our previous video uh, if you haven't seen it please uh, go and check it out I've given an introduction about all that it is that you need to know how a telescope works and what is what is a telescope all about so how far can we see through a telescope so I think I've answered that question in the previous video now in our uh, in this video we'll go a little bit more deep dive into what can I do with a telescope so yeah of course I can see distant object nearby but why do we have so many types of telescopes why do we have so many telescopes across the world what are the different types of telescopes it's not just Newtonian uh, Galilean or Cassegrain there are more of these so what are the different types of telescopes and well can I have a super massive telescope and still like you know do all the science that I can so what are the limitations so we'll go a little bit more deep dive into that in this video so uh, so before I start I just wanted to quickly showcase a, a Newtonian telescope sorry I didn't bring my Cassegrain telescope here today but uh, this is a typical Newtonian telescope so here basically down here you have the primary mirror which I can show you briefly so I think you can see it so the primary mirror is all the way at the back over here so that's the primary mirror it's about 10 inches in diameter or 25 centimeters wide so the right the light from the stars technically goes through this uh, hits the primary mirror and then it comes all the way it it converges it hits the secondary plane mirror over here which is placed at an angle and then this uh, secondary uh, the light from the secondary mirror then focuses onto my focuser over here where I'll place my eyepiece so my eyepiece can slide in over here and well voila I can now focus and I'll be able to see my objects so this is what this is a typical Newton Newtonian telescope now uh, the advantage of Newtonian telescope as I said earlier just a quick recap is that um, a Newtonian telescope uh, uh, doesn't have as much as aberrations as a refracting telescope does now speaking of it I can show you another typical refracting telescope so let me keep this guy down there I think stay good boy okay so now this is a typical refracting telescope that I have in my hand now this one is more uh, these days mostly refracting telescopes are used for uh, imaging so I use my refracting telescope for my astrophotography setup so I just play I just insert a DSLR camera on this end and then I plug it on a good decent mount and then which tracks the earth's rotation which counteracts the earth's rotation which I'll explain in a second uh, and that's it then basically I can shoot images through this so if you look over here I think you must be able to see my primary lens which is about 70 mm in uh, 70, this is a 70 mm in diameter and typically on all these telescopes you will see a second number so if I can bring it closer to the camera you must be able to see two numbers there's like it says 70 mm and f6 so if you go to an online telescope shop or if you go to a telescope shop or you meet an astronomer an amateur astronomer who has you know an entourage of telescopes like me who is crazy about these things uh, we all if you ask about the telescope and you know the configuration of the telescope typically we tell you three numbers the three numbers that we are really proud of we never talk about magnification because magnification is something that we are not after so one thing that we always talk about is the diameter of the primary mirror so the diameter of the primary mirror is what matters the most uh, the second thing is the uh, what we call as the focal ratio so typically like say this one is an f6 as well so what do I mean by f6 is that the focal length of the telescope is six times that of the diameter of the uh, primary mirror so the diameter of the pri the focal length is six times the diameter of the primary this is I think f6.7 and that is an f6 uh, refractor so what does it mean like why do we care so let me just recap all the things again so one thing is that um, the 
larger the focal length, the greater is the magnification. So the magnification goes as FO over FE and the resolution, like how close of two objects can I see uh, like uh, as two separate objects, the resolution goes as 1.22 lambda over the diameter of the telescope. Um, so this is what matters to us, like this second number is what that matters to us the most. So the shorter the focal length, we generally prefer shorter focal length and larger diameter. The reason for that, I mean we have two main reasons, one is as I explained in the previous video, uh, now if I have, a, yeah, if I have a, my mirror, I don't want my light to stray away, I don't want my photons to stray away. I want my photons to stay in, uh, uh, like on, on the path that I have des designated for the light. Or I don't want any other stray photon, like let me take some random light sources around. I don't want any stray photons to, you know, step in and interact with my main optics. Now, if you look at, say for example, this guy over here, he loves uh, stray photons. As in, now I've got a light source over there. Now, if I, if I have a star somewhere over there, this guy will also like take these light, hit it in there and, you know, interact with my optical path. So, these things are going to mess up my image quality. So, the shorter the focal length, the less of chances I give for that. It's more of a practical reason. There's no big scientific reason behind it. It's just a quick practical, like, you know, rule of thumb. The other big thing about having a shorter focal length is that uh, now as I told you like most of the objects in the night sky are super wide right now most of the pretty objects that we go for uh, that, that we really uh, prefer let's say Andromeda galaxy deep sky objects right Andromeda galaxy or uh, Ophiuchus star forming region or uh, Orion nebula or any of these nebula, they are humongous objects. So, Rho Fukai, which is like a really beautiful star forming region, or Eta Carina, the Carina Nebula. Google the, these names, Google Eta Carina, Google Rho Fukai. You, it's, if, if you look at it in real scale, they can easily occupy a significant chunk of the night sky. So, you don't really need this telescope. If I use this telescope, I'm going to look into a tiny portion of that Ophiuchi cloud. So, that's why we don't really need a telescope in all these situations. But if I want to say shoot an image of Rho of Yukai or let's say uh, Andromeda galaxy, this guy is going to do a good enough job for me. Now, the point here is this is an F6, but the diameter is small, which means I won't be able to resolve the stars of Andromeda galaxy as good as this guy over here. So that's my downside. But if I want to get my resolution and I still want to shoot um, uh, Andromeda galaxy, I can go for a shorter focal length telescope. So typically like uh, say like motorcycle enthusiasts, they really love about the BHP, the brake, the braking horsepower of the motorbikes, right? Or it can be the rake of the motorbikes and stuff. So the power of the motorbikes. Now typically for an, for an amateur astronomer, the thing that we really drool a lot about is that F ratio. So earlier I said the F ratio is about uh, Get another marker. Earlier I said the F ratio, like say mine, what I have is something around F6, right? Now typically people go to something like F2, F3. F2, we don't have that much. F2.7 is what the lowest focal ratio that I've seen right now in market and that's really expensive. F2, F3 are really expensive telescopes. So typically what we go for is somewhere between F4 to F6. This is what we go. There are also la larger focal length. There are F11s and F12s. These are usually what we call as the planetary telescopes. So there are like a few Cassegrain telescopes that we use for uh, planetary imaging or super small uh, field of view objects. So for example, let's take Sombrero Galaxy or uh, the Crab Nebula. These are having like, uh, they, they have an angular diameter in arc minutes, like one or two arc minutes. So these uh, objects, I definitely need a telescope like this. So if I want to look into Sombrero Galaxy, I can't, I can do it with that telescope, but I can't really do it as easily as I can do Andromeda. So th this guy is going to do a better job for me. 
that's where I need my magnification. So that's where I can I usually go for a lo longer focal length telescopes. But again, over there, I still have to keep in mind that my quality of the image goes down as I go for a longer focal length telescopes. So F10, F11 telescopes, you have all these uh, Celestron SCTs and stuff. People generally use it for like super short uh, FOV objects, field of view, what we call as FOVs, field of view objects or planets because in planets I need both resolution and magnification. Quality wise, it's fine because now again, the quality, there is another reason that hits us, which is the brightness of the object. So the further out it is, the fainter it is going to be. Now planets and moon and everything are really close by, which means they're bright enough for me. So I can, you know, relax a little bit on the quality. So say uh, if I want to shoot or in daytime and I have a really horrible camera, I'm still fine because I have enough light around me. I can still shoot a decent video out of it. But if it's nighttime and it's dark, I really need a good camera. So uh, that's the difference over here. So like I can go for lower quality, but I can still compensate it with the processing. But for night sky and if it's like say something that I don't really need a small field of view, I can go for this. Now, just a quick overview. Now I'll just get to the main part of this video on why what, what what can we do with these telescopes? What, what, what is so I'll go with say let me start with uh, a few science cases that we can do. So with uh, with more mostly let me start with the amateur telescopes and then I'll go with what I used to research on like what are the kind of instruments that I worked with professionally. So for amateur telescopes typically what we do is we place a camera at the end over here instead of an eyepiece we remove this whole part typically or oops, typically we remove this part and we place a camera over here with an adapter or I keep here or I also have a T-ring adapter that I can put over here or on the other telescope and basically the whole game with astronomy is about collecting as much as light as we can. Now, again, coming to another part of this is that why we amateurs or we astronomers really love telescopes with larger diameter. Now, if you look at this, what does it remind you of? It reminds you of a good bucket, right? Uh, so telescopes are also nothing but light buckets. So that means the larger the bucket I have, the more photons I can collect. Imagine it's almost like a rain, right? So the larger the bucket I have, the more photons I collect. The more photons I collect, the easier I can see the object because these are like super faint objects that are really far away that I'll only see, that I will only get one or two photons out of it. So the larger the bucket, the more photons I'll see. So that's why we always prefer going for larger and larger telescopes because they can collect more and more photons and at the same time give us better resolution and also give us, you know, good sensitivity. So now that's where how far I can see through a telescope, right? Question comes in. So the better sensitivity that I have, the further I can see. Now imagine with my eyes, I have the ability to control the exposure of my eyes just like, just like how I can do it on a DSLR camera. Our life would have been so much different. I would have used the long exposure and sit over in the, on a lawn and then under the night sky and I'll just enjoy my life. Because I can see as far as I can. Because the longer I expose my eye, I don't need a telescope. The longer I expose, if you just do an ultra long exposure, if you look into the Hubble deep field, uh, or right now the new James Webb telescopes deep field, right? They are all ultra long wide, uh, long exposure images. Now, I remember the Hubble one, it took almost one month. They were just looking at an empty patch in sky. It was completely empty. Every day, one hour they were shooting at that empty patch for one month. And then they st stacked all these images together. And that's when they saw that Hubble ultra deep field. You can see galaxies as far as 13 billion light years away. So if a Hubble telescope, which is about to the size of a school bus, about two meters in diameter and about to the size of a school bus can look that far, even this guy can do the same thing. He can also check out all the way till 13 billion light years. It's just that our eyes or our cameras are not sensitive enough 
to actually record it. And also, well, the bucket is a little bit small. So which means I need to shoot long enough to collect as much as photons as say the Hubble can collect. Now there is another, uh, so this is what we generally do, what we call as astrophotography. We place a camera over there and we, we take pretty pictures. Now is pretty pictures all that it is? No, not exactly. You can do some really good science with it. Now I'll just give you a couple of use cases what you can do. So I know a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Vishnu Reddy, who is like a professor. Um, he has discovered asteroids. Now typically what we do as asteroids, uh, uh, like how do we discover asteroids, right? So if I look into the night sky and I see a lot of stars. Now if I keep tracking them, now the stars will remain in one place, right? Because I'm, I'm tracking them, which is I'm just counteracting Earth's rotation. So when I counteract Earth's rotation, um, I can... My, my stars are going to be fixed. If I make sure the stars are fixed in my place, there will be like one tiny rock that just zips through. Now, typically these things are our asteroids. Now, you have to have a little bit of luck and you have to check and you have to have persist. You need to uh, like, you know, uh, try a lot. You need to have a lot of uh, tenacity and persistence and you can find a tel uh, an asteroid. So uh, this is like, this is one hobby that you can do. The other one is exoplanets. Now, exo for exoplanets, sensitivity is the key in the game. Now, what happens with exoplanets is that uh, there are different ways in which you can detect an exoplanet. One way is what we call as the transit method. Now, what we call by transit method is if I have a star, okay, uh, and I have if I have a source of light and I have something that's going to block my source of light, uh, my, the 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 amount of the brightness of that star is going to dip over time, right? Now, if, if I see there is a dip in time, now that means, hey, there's a planet going in front of it. So there are all these different science cases that you can actually do with a telescope and a simple DSLR camera with a telescope like this one. So that's the whole, uh, say, use case of telescopes. From an amateur level, you can do science or you can do astrophotography, taking pretty pictures of the night sky. And well, you, you, you can actually take pictures that are literally out of the world. So, so that's like one thing. But now let me come to another major issue with these telescopes. That is, uh, I was talking to you about uh, resolution, right? So the larger the diameter that I have, the better the resolution is. But then we have another problem in this whole situation. The problem is the air around us and the atmosphere that we have around us. Now, as we know, our air or atmosphere has water vapor and whatnot. And it has its own refracting properties, just like the lens on that telescope or the mirror on this one or the lens on my eyepiece. It has its own refracting properties. And this air, unlike that lens or the mirror or my eyepiece lens, it's super turbulent, as in the system keeps changing all over the time, as in within like a few milliseconds, I will start seeing a lot of different uh, changes in the atmosphere, right? Uh, now, uh, this is what in astronomy, we call it as seeing, astronomical seeing. Now, this is the main reasons why we, this is the main reason why we see stars twinkle. The reason why they twinkle is that I can basically, sh so I have my star over here. If I, on an ideal situation, have like waves coming from the star and I have my bucket over here, which is my telescope. I collect the waves, it comes in, it hits my mirror. Okay, and then I then focus it onto my secondary. And for now, let me say I have a Newtonian and then I get it to my eyepiece and then I, I observe over here. Now, this is on an ideal situation when I don't, it's, it's just the star in my telescope, great. But that's not what happens over here. What happens is that I've got something in, in between these two, which is our atmosphere. So what happens over here is I have something that's Earth's atmosphere, which has all these turbulent air pockets. Okay, so there are all these turbulent air pockets and these air pockets act as small refracting units. They act like a small lens at times. They act like a small... Uh, glass blanks in between. So what happens is I have like a plain wave, a smooth clean wave. If it's a smooth clean wave, I'm going to focus it and I'm going to see the cleanest picture of a star. 
But the atmosphere, what happens is once the starlight goes through the atmosphere, this part of, let's say, this part of the light is going to be refracted this way. Over here, it will be refracted that way, this way, and that way. So eventually, what I have is some crooked way front of light. Now, if it's crooked, my telescope is, is going to be like, dude, I wanted a clean one, crooked one. It's not going to give me a cleaner image. So what happens is, if you, you can actually see a similar effect if you look through, say, a desert or a racetrack. You will see like, you know, some, uh, the, the image wavering at the distance. Now, if you look at the moon through my telescope, you can easily see that on the surface of the moon, you will see like waves going on. It's not some waves going on on the moon. It's basically the atmosphere above us that acts as a, as a second lens that messes up our whole system. Now, um, that's the reason why we started putting telescopes in outer space. So that's the reason why we have James Webb Space Telescope, we have the Chandra X-ray Telescope, we have Spitzer, we have Hubble, we have uh, Herschel, Kepler, so on. And uh, now also TESS, J yeah, so all these telescopes are in outer space because, well, one way out of it is getting out of this entire mess, right? I see, I have a mess right above my head. What can I do? Let me get out of there. So that's the reason why we go to outer space with our telescopes. But again, like, you know, we have to rely on the engineers. We can't take, you know, whatever, a super massive telescope over there. So typically what we use is something called as adaptive optics to clean it up. Well, what it does is it measures how much off it is in each of these points. Uh, through something called as a wavefront sensor and then the light goes through the wavefront sensor before it hits the camera it goes through the wavefront sensor and the wavefront sensor what it immediately does is it knows how far it is right so it immediately counteracts so it just places a mirror that goes in the opposite way and it counteracts and so which means my my telescope will see a cleaner flatter wavefront hitting my mirror uh, so this is what adaptive optics does so uh, these are just like I'm, I'm just saying this just to give you an overview of what is happening over there. So now um, this is like one problem that we have with uh, so with the atmospheric uh, with the atmospheric turbulence we tend to lose resolution as well because my light quality goes off and I lose resolution. So essentially like. Uh, uh, yeah, it doesn't really matter the larger the telescope I have, however large I go, my resolution still is dictated by the atmosphere, not by my telescope. Not strictly, I will still see some difference in the resolution, but the atmosphere plays a big role in the resolution of the telescope. So <clears throat> that's another thing. Now, okay, now again, the game is all about having the widest telescope as possible, right? It's not about having the longest telescope possible. Having the widest telescope possible, having the most sensitive camera in the world, we can do magic. Now, uh, this is where, uh, again, like uh, we have um, uh, a few other issues. That is, how big of a telescope can I build, right? Now, um, with this mirror, it's a mirror blank, it's a solid object. Right? It's just, I have the same problem with the lens. I can't build a lens that is like, you know, 10 meters wide. I can. I mean, no one can stop me. But, well, I have gravity that can stop me. And one small thing, I can break it. So, there is another problem that is, well, gravity. Right? This is not a simple structure. Right? I have a mirror blank that is, that is, that is like this. Then I've got a concave structure over here. That means I have more stuff on these two sides and less stuff over here. So what happens is gravity tends to pull these two ends more higher, more stronger. So if I have something that is 40 meters wide, I will easily break it because it's super thin over here. It can break in its own weight. So what we generally do, this is like one, so I can't, and also like making a smooth surface that is like 40 meters wide is a nightmare. So what we generally do is we make smaller segments, like kind of a honeycomb. So we make a smaller segmented mirror. Each one 
plays a part of my concave uh, structure. So this is what, how James Webb is also built. So you have like a honeycomb like structure, something like this. And if you look at James Webb mirror, it is also built this way. And there are actuators behind the mirrors just to make sure that the overall shape is well maintained. So that's how James Webb or another telescope that I worked with, the Grand Telescope Canarias GTC in La Palma, it's about 10.2 meters wide. So largest single mirror, single piece mirror that I've seen is about 8 meters wide, which is at uh, the very large telescope interferometer in Paranal, Chile. So I've been saying about VLTI. So now, again with the segmented mirror, I can only go till a certain point. Now we have like, there are two telescopes that are currently coming up. One is the TMT, the 30 meter telescope. And the other one is the ELT, the European Extremely Large Telescope, which is 42 meters wide. Now, uh, these two telescopes, again, they are still 30 meters and 42 meters. We are greedy. We want the biggest telescope possible again, right? So what can I do about it? I can't have like, you know, uh, I, I, if, if, if I had the ability to build it, I would build a telescope that's 500 meters wide. Or I can even build a telescope that's a kilometer wide, right? And I can be able to see, I can resolve the distant galaxies. And it's not about uh, say, like being able to see it, it's being able to resolve them. I can see like all the small stars that are there in the distant galaxy over there. Or even if possible, like I can see, you know, a uh, few other finer details on uh, Andromeda galaxy or the, in the inner parsecs, in the inner region of the Andromeda galaxy, where you have the active galactic nuclei, you have the narrow line region and broad line region. There's like a lot of activities going on over there. There's a supermassive black hole, which eats up stars left, right and center. So, and also like say, Newtonian physics fails over there. Okay, one of my colleagues recently, she, not recently, like in 2017, she was, she actually became pretty famous. She was, she had interviews in BBC and so on, where she found out precisional uh, orbits around the center of our Milky Way. For this, I need a super good resolution, resolving telescope. Or in my own case, if I want to, I look into some objects called protoplanetary disks or exoplanets. Now, if I want to see exoplanets, I want to resolve them right right so that means if i have a kilometer telescope i would be even able to see the uh, earth like planets which are in the inner regions of the system now typically with a decent uh, resolution that we have right now out there i i might be able to resolve some hot jupiters or jupiter kind of planets that are like you know about 3 4 astronomical units so one astronomical unit is the distance from sun to earth uh, three, four astronomical units is something like, you know, between Mars and Jupiter. Uh, I can resolve like a Jupiter kind of planet over there. So which means if, if I'm an alien and I'm looking at the solar system, uh, with the current thing, I'm, I would be able to only see Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. I won't be able to see the inner planets. It's Mars or Earth. So which means if I build a large enough telescope, I can see Earth and Mars because that's where the game is, right? That's where we all live. As an alien, I would, as, as, an, as an Earthling, I would love aliens to see Earth, right? So that's the point. But now we can't see, we can't build a one kilometer wide telescope. So what is the other way out around it? So that's when, that's why I was explaining to you about the interferometer. So what we do here is that we basically take, instead of one giant telescope, we place multiple telescopes that are separated by a distance and we then collect light from each of these telescopes and then we interfere, we combine them together and together they work almost as good as a telescope that is say if I separate this and the largest distance between them is about let's say one kilometer, I will have uh, it, it almost functions as a telescope that is one kilometer wide. I have some limitations over there. I can't do as much of a clear picture as a good old single mirror telescope can do, but I can still do some pretty good science with it. So I just wanted to give you an intro about that one. So this is exactly, uh, so I just wanted to have like a quick deep 
dive into what other things are around telescope, what other stuff that affects us and what can you do with a telescope. So it's not just about looking at the planets or galaxies, it's about taking good pictures, it's also about, uh, yeah, it's about taking good pictures about it, it's also about doing really nice science about it and also I wanted to quickly explain this before closing this video about choosing the right telescope. Uh, we always, even I have done it, everybody does it, our first telescope is always a bad choice. It's, it's almost like buying a car. So I just can't go and say, okay, what is the best car out there in the market? I'm going to buy it. Of course, the best car could be, you know, a Ferrari or a Lamborghini, but can I afford it? And the second thing is, do I really need a Ferrari or Lamborghini to drive to my office, which is like five kilometers away from my home? No. So I don't really need a Lamborghini. A good, a good old Suzuki or a good old Ford can do the job for me, right? So why do I need to go all the way up there? So what do I need to do to choose my right telescope? So the question that you need to ask yourself is what you want to look, what do you want to do with the telescope? As in, uh, say initially when I started, I said, okay, I want a telescope. Why do you? So my teacher, Professor Devadas, was like a 10 year old kid who wanted to see everything. He said, why do you want a telescope? I said, yeah, I want to look into, I want to check out the moon. I want to check out the planets. This is what everybody answers first. I did, I did the same thing. And he said, okay, hey, here you go. There's a six inch F10 telescope, just use it. So it was a 125 mm wide and F10. So that means it's 1250 mm is the focal length of the telescope. I was like, I was happy. I pointed it to Jupiter, I pointed it to Saturn. I could see everything, I was happy. And then um, that's when like I wanted to look into deep space. So I started pointing it into globular clusters. I started pointing it to galaxies. And then I realized, okay, all these galaxies and globular clusters are nothing but white fuzzy blobs that I really, really need to look hard to find it. So that's when I was like, okay, this is not my telescope. And after that, I realized, okay, this is what I need because this guy is not really good with planets because this one is an F6, like shorter focal length, which means not that great in magnification. Uh, so, but then this guy can resolve good and he can collect a lot more light than my six inch F9 telescope, which is another Newtonian. Now this one can do even more wonder. Now this mount is called a Dobsonian mount. I can explain it in a future video if possible. Now that's when, uh, so that's the next telescope. With this, I can do, uh, Messier hunts. I can go, there's like something called a Messier catalog. It's a catalog of 110 deep space objects. I have done Messier marathons, Messier, cat, Messier hunts and everything with this one. But is this the right telescope again? The answer is no. Because after this, I met a lot of people who got into astrophotography and I was like, I wanted to do astrophotography. I tried to plug in a camera over here. This one doesn't have a tracker, which means the earth revolves at 1400 kilometers an hour, which means my object is going to zip through. So, well, this guy can't do the job of astrophotography for me. So what do I need next is, okay, then I had to go for an astrophotography telescope, which means I need to invest in a good mount, good tracker, and I had to get back to my refractor. With this, I can't do the same observation as this one but I can do good astrophotography with this one. So that's the difference between all these three telescopes. So before you choose a telescope, you need to identify what do I want to do? Do I want to do photography? Then a refractor or a small telescope, an astrophotography setup, an astrograph as what we call it. That is more cooler for astrophotography. If you want to do observation, especially deep space, well, a good larger diameter, smaller FO, uh, uh, shorter focal length telescopes like these ones can do magic. But again, moving them around is a nightmare. As in transporting it from one place to another is a nightmare. Uh, or if you want to look into planets, go for a good Cassegrain long focal length telescope. But my advice always before I close the video right now, my advice is first understand the night sky. Look up at the night sky, learn the night sky first. Try to understand the constellations. As I said, you don't need a telescope. If you go to a dark enough site, Andromeda galaxy is just in front of you. You can see it with your own eyes. You don't need a telescope. It's four times bigger than sun or the moon. So you can really see it without a telescope. So 
after that try investing in a good binoculars a binoculars can get you even better resolution and you can easily carry it along with you and then you you have an idea on what you want to do do you want to go into astrophotography you want to do deep space observation or do you want to end up you know spending all the money that you have on uh, with you like what i did and well be broke and have too many telescopes at hand that's what happened so with that being said i would like to close this video thanks for watching